Welcome everyone. We are pleased you can join us on this parallel session of the Commission of the Status of Women on Gender Equality Pathways to Peace. My name is Neda Samanpour. I am the founder and chief executive officer of Global Peace and Prosperity Forum, the organization hosting this event aimed at facilitating reflection and finding solutions as to why women continue to face barriers to the realization of equality despite the ideal of gender equality being acknowledged and voiced, not only as a fundamental human right, but as a necessary foundation for peaceful, prosperous and sustainable world as enshrined in the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, the UN Security Council 1325 and Agenda 2030. The Honorable Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said that women belong in all places where decisions are being made. Research on women, peace and security provides strong evidence that women's empowerment and gender equality are associated with more peaceful and stable societies. Cross-country studies also find evidence that high levels of gender inequality and gender-based violence in a society are associated with increased vulnerability to civil war, interstate war, and the use of more severe forms of violence in conflict. Changes in women's status or vulnerability, such as an increase in domestic violence or a reduction in girls' school attendance, often are viewed as early warnings of social and political insecurity. The larger the gender gap, defined as the differences in experiences and opportunities between men and women, the more likely a country is to be involved in interstate conflict and to use violence as a first response in a conflict setting. It is clear gender inequality is born out of dominance and discrimination. No one can deny that systemic discrimination has created deep inequities impacting millions across generations. Ultimately, if we can overcome the barriers to the realization of gender equality, we can overcome the barriers to all forms of inequality and prejudice. So when we speak of gender inequality, gender equality, we are not just talking about giving women their fundamental human rights. We are talking about creating a better world for all. I am delighted that we are joined by a distinguished panel who will share their valuable insights on this important topic. Barana Chakrabarti, who will moderate the panel discussion, is a member of the House of Lords in the UK. She was Shadow Attorney General for England and Wales from 2016 to 2020, and she served as a director of the human rights group Liberty from 2003 to 2016. Shami, please, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Neda, and, and once more, welcome to everyone. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, and what a wonderful panel uh, we have to listen to and engage with. Uh, they're each going to make some opening remarks for, for five or six uh, minutes, uh, and then we will be in discussion together. Uh, there is a chat function. Um, if we could primarily use that for, for tabling questions for the subsequent dis uh, discussion. It will make it easier for colleagues to identify those questions. Um, and um, to begin then, it is my absolute um, privilege to um, introduce to you Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa Gasser. She's the president of the 73rd session of the United Nations General Assembly and the former foreign minister of Ecuador. Maria, please. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Shami, for this introduction. And of course, I would like to start by thanking Neda Salmanpour and the Global Peace and Prosperity Forum for having me here today uh, and uh, take part of this uh, panel to exchange ideas on the role of women's leadership in building more just, sustainable, and peaceful societies. This uh, topic can meet, cannot be more timely. Greetings to all the wonderful panelists that are uh, joining this conversation uh, today. So I, I was saying that this conversation is very timely uh, because uh, the Gender Equality Forum in Mexico is around the corner starting next Monday to commemorate the 25 years of the landmark Beijing Platform for Action. And uh, one of the expected outcomes uh, of the forum is the launching of a forward-looking 
a very promising compact on women, peace and security and humanitarian action. And basically the compact is uh, aim, uh, aimed at uh, advancing implementation on the women, peace and security agenda. Why is uh, this issue uh, um, critical to so important? I'd like to highlight uh, two main reasons. And, and, uh, and uh, please, uh, you know, ask me to stop when my time is over. But the first reason is because women uh, are more uh, hit or have been uh, hit the hardest in times of crisis and conflict. And, and second, because the full participation of women in the prevention, resolution, and post-conflict processes bring about better, longer, last efforts wide. Um, armed conflicts and humanitarian crises have always had disproportionate impacts on women and girls. Just in 2019, for example, the, the United Nations documented 3,000 cases of conflict-related sexual violence, of which 96% target women and girls. So uh, the, the vulnerable situation are found in the social impact, for example, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this crisis has provoked uneven impacts on the welfare and well-being of women in terms of job losses, care work overload, lack of access to social protection and health services, and escalating domestic violence. And at the same time, the meaningful inclusion of women in decision-making increases effectiveness in conflict prevention and resolution efforts, bringing new perspectives and solutions to the table. There is uh, copious evidence that when it comes to political representation, as the percentage of women in parliament increases by 5%, a state is five times less likely to use violence when faced with an international crisis. It is also less likely that this particular country would abuse human rights, commit torture, or wrongfully imprison its citizens. Evidence also shows that uh, women's participation increases the probability of a peace agreement lasting at least two years by 20%, and by 35%, the probability of a peace agreement lasting at least 15 years. Only if we include women, you know, in the decision-making table. So according to, to UN Women, uh, an analysis of 40 peace processes since the end of the Cold War show that in cases where women were able to exercise a strong influence on negotiation processes, there was a much higher chance that an agreement would be reached than when women exercise weak or no influences. Um, influence. In case of strong involvement of women, an agreement was almost always reached. And uh, this has also been my experience as former uh, foreign minister, as former uh, minister of defense of my country. I took active part of, of the peace talks between uh, ELN, um, Ejército de Liberación Nacional in, in Colombia, and the Colombian government. In three months, we were able to reach uh, um, a partial ceasefire. Um, unfortunately, uh, the talks uh, just stopped uh, for various reasons. But um, I have to say that it does work uh, to include parity in the, in the negotiation tables really does uh, pay off. I think that uh, women have uh, proven, you know, um, every time uh, to be strategic agents in sustaining peace. Uh, even though they, they still represent a minority of elected politicians worldwide. And these uh, arithmetics of inequality need to be, you know, stated, uh, you know, every time. As of today, only 22 countries have women as heads of state or government. That is around 10% of all countries worldwide.
and only 21% of government ministers are women, uh, with only 14 countries having achieved 50% or more women in cabinets. At the current ratio, gender parity in ministerial positions will not be achieved before 2077. So I think we cannot uh, wait uh, that long. So in, in, uh, in parliaments, 75% of parliamentarians worldwide are still men. And so there is a lot of homework to do. And let me very quickly uh, go to what has happened with one of the crowning achievements of the UN Security Council, which is UN Security Council Resolution 1325 that recognizes uh, the, the role um, of, of women in sustaining peace and peace processes. Uh, unfortunately, after over the past 20 years, this resolution uh, has uh, been, uh, you know, extremely important. It has been the basis for eight further Security Council resolutions, which have addressed the critical issue of women, peace and security. But unfortunately, uh, we have to acknowledge that there is a huge implementation gap. Uh, today, um, uh, less than 50% of the countries adopting, uh, uh, have adopted national action plans for the implementation of the, the Security Council Resolution 1325. And just 32% of these plans included a budget for the implementation thereof. And at the same time, uh, in 2020, out of approximately 25,000 peacekeepers, uh, were women, and they constituted only 4.8% of military contingents at the UN and 10.9% of police units in UN missions, which means that women are still underrepresented in our, uh, in the United Nations peacekeeping uh, efforts. So all these issues are going to be addressed next week at the Generation Equality Forum. Uh, I think the forum provides us with a great opportunity to overcome the structural limitations hindering the rights and equal participation of women in decision making in general and in decision making in peace and security in particular. So the forum uh, is helping to move forward the recognition of the transformative power of women. Uh, and for that, um, uh, there is a very promising a new compact on, on women, peace and security and humanitarian action that is going to be launched in Mexico next week. And um, this compact seeks to initiate a voluntary multi-stakeholder monitoring and accountability process, um, engaging key global, regional and national actors in helping to narrow the gaps between the standards established not only in resolution 1325, but in all the follow-up resolutions and the concrete actions in the women, peace and security uh, agenda. This uh, compact uh, will establish a mechanism to coordinate efforts for the implementation of the women, peace and security agenda, uh, strengthen coordination, uh, coherence, uh, cooperation among countries, um, alliances and partnerships uh, with humanitarian organizations worldwide, uh, increase and boost the financial commitments to uh, advance the women, peace and security uh, agenda, and also work on the COVID-19 response plans, especially in areas of uh, humanitarian uh, needs. So in conclusion, because I think my time is up, uh, it is critical that any effort initiated on enhancing peace and responding to conflict situations, women be at the front and center of peace negotiations, of reconstruction and reconciliation programs, of efforts and mechanisms ending impunity and ensuring redress for crimes committed against women, and of mechanisms providing sufficient and sustainable resources to uh, women's peace organizations and to um, national affirmative action policies uh, as well. So in, in the concept note uh, uh, that was shared before this session, there is an excellent quotation of the Honorable Judge 
uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg that you, you mentioned, uh, Neda. Uh, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. Uh, she could have not been more right. Uh, I think that more than ever in this post-COVID-19 world, we must acknowledge that women have the power to be agents of peace uh, and change, and that uh, women's leadership is crucial for building forward better. So we need to match policy with action, laws uh, with transformation at, at the local level, and we have the opportunity. And I hope to see you all next week at the Generation Equality Forum. Uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity and back to you, Shami. Thank you so much, Maria, and welcome to people who've been joining us even through that. And um, I've been seen, seeing the greetings appearing uh, on my screen from, from, from all over the world. And, and next we have uh, the Honourable Senator Mabina Jaffa QC, uh, who represents the province of British Columbia in the Canadian Senate, where she is also the chair of the um, of the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. She was uh, appointed in uh, June 2001 by the Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, and she's the first Muslim senator, the first African-born senator, and the first senator of South Asian descent. So another, uh, another wonderful contributor to our, to our panel. Uh, Mabina, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Baroness uh, um, Shami for the very nice introduction and thank you Neda and the Global Peace and uh, Prosperity Forum for inviting me here today. It's a real honor for me to be here. I want to thank you and thank you for the introduction and thank you for me, have, me, having me be part of this very important discussion. I think I will follow really well with what Maria has said. So it's uh, perfect the way we are, uh, have been set up. As a parliamentarian and a longtime peace advocate, I've had the privilege of witnessing the impact of political will on peace processes and the progress of peace efforts. In 2000 and the years prior, I witnessed the mobilization of civil society and the work done side by side with politicians and parliamentarians to bring the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security, it on on the to the to light, and most all of you here know very well about that. And we know that the main motivation was sustainable peace. And as peace advocates know, we women be included, and chances to achieve that are much higher. But what is sustainable peace? If it is not merely the absence of war, it is the prevention of conflict from reoccurring. A woman peace builder once told me, how can I convince someone to drop their guns without solving the problems that led them to carry the gun in the first place? Women peace builders know this very well. When they work on the ground to de-radicalize young men and women, they start addressing their social and economic grievances. I have a very good friend and colleague, Musarat Kadin, who works in Pakistan and who has formed community peace groups. These groups are trained to raise awareness and also sound alarm to signs of radicalization appearing. They found a group of women who are in business of sewing suicide vests for extremist groups. When they found that, they realized that these women did not have any clear ideological investment. It was simply a way and an only source of income for them. The solution was to have these women find another source of income. And my friend Musarat and others found a way for these women instead of making suicide vests to make bags which they sell all over the world. During COVID-19, I've heard from many women peace builders. And you know, every Thursday, I meet with around 65 women from 65 different countries as chair of ICANN. And women peace builders suddenly realize 
that they had to mobilize and help on the ground and on, by issuing masks, food, soap, as violence against women became a shadow pan pandemic, as they say. The reason for them to do that was the extremist groups were filling the void left by governments and providing such aid to people, eventually recruiting them. It all stems from social grievances, economic hardships, and underdevelopment. The relationship between the women, peace and security agenda, and sustainable development and peace is very clear, especially to women peace builders working on the ground in their communities. UN Secretary General Antonio Guerritas said in a statement two years ago, gender equality and women's rights are fundamental to global progress on peace and security, human rights and sustainable development. Sustainable peace requires sustainable development and sustainable development relies on ending discrimination towards women and providing equal opportunities for education and employment. Gender equality has been conclusively shown to stimulate development and growth and consequently peace. That is why the implementation of UN Security Council resolution is crucial. And I started by speaking about political power. When I was the envoy to Sudan and I had the political power to make a difference, when I was in Abuja, Nigeria, during the Pardar peace process, I realized that the UN planes were going to pick up the main, the man from different uh, areas of act where they were seeking asylum in Europe. And I went to the mediator and said, if you're picking up the men, why are you not picking up the women from refugee camps? I won't go into the challenges I had, but I have to say that Mediator Salim Salim, the former president of Tanzania, agreed with me. We picked up 17 UN planes, picked up 17 women from refugee camps, and then brought them to the Darfur peace process. That was because we had the political power, and that's what we need. And when those women came to the peace process, there was one, there were many incidents like this, but I'll share one. There was a challenge with a river. And I know, and a woman got up, a very short woman, a very strong woman and said, why are you arguing about that river? As a child, I went to pick, I went to fetch water from that river. As a woman, I don't. As a married woman, I don't because the river has dried up. The women are the community's eyes, ears and pulse. That is why we need women at peace processes. And that is what we are asking. If we're going to have sustainable peace, we need to have both men and women at peace tables. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Mabina. And, and once more, we're hearing these very compelling and evidence-based arguments for the role that uh, women and gender equality can play in in, in, in peace building. Uh, and now um, I turn to Professor Payam Akhavan. Uh, we're going to call him an ally because he is the he is the uh, the gentleman on our on our panel today. Professor at McGill University in Montreal, a uh, member of the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague, and a designated arbitrator and conciliator at the International Centre for the Settlement of Investment Disputes of the of the World Bank Group. Uh, the 2017 CBC Massey lecturer and the author of the best-selling In Search of a Better World, Payam. Uh, thank you, Baroness uh, Chakrabarti, for your kind. Thank you to Neda Salman Poor uh, and the Global Peace and Prosperity Forum for giving me the honor of being on such a distinguished panel. Um, I feel a certain uh, heavy weight on my shoulders to speak as the lone male representative on this panel. But I think it's very important that I do. And I noticed 
that among the participants, there are a handful of uh, men who are participating. I would hope that part of gender equality would be for these events also to have gender balance. And this perhaps goes to the question of what do we mean by gender to begin with? Well, gender is a social construction. It's a set of values, assumptions, and ideas that we have about each other, our place in society. Uh, but those ideas uh, are hardly merely in the theoretical plane. They have very definite consequences and they are reflected in the inequities that we see in the world today. And perhaps if I can begin by uh, speaking to the role of men in liberating themselves, liberating themselves by helping women achieve equality. And this perhaps is one very important dimension which is often lost. I've dealt for the past 30 years, uh, formerly as a United Nations uh, prosecutor and now as an international human rights lawyer with victims of uh, torture, rape, genocide throughout our world. And one thing that has been impressed upon me repeatedly is that committing injustice does not only deny the humanity of the victim, it also denies the humanity of the perpetrator. Dehumanizing others not only negates the humanity of the victim, it also negates the humanity of the perpetrator. And in that very simple observation is perhaps a profound redefinition of power. We talk about power, but what do we really mean by power? Is power about the domination of others or is power about the empowerment of others? Could we even see the lust for power and domination as a want of power, as a lack of self-worth, as a lack of self-understanding, which has to be compensated for by doing uh, all manner of uh, iniquity. I would perhaps share with you um, some reflections on my work in various conflict zones around the world as a UN prosecutor. And one sees time and again that dehumanization, in particular the negation of, if you like, the feminine. And the feminine isn't just about women, but it's also about the feminine self in men. That negation of that dimension is crucial and indispensable to cataclysmic violence. I began my career in Bosnia-Herzegovina during the 1990s, when the horrors of systematic rape as a weapon of war came to the surface. Next, there was the horrific genocide in Rwanda in 1994, when once again, horrific sexual violence was an integral part of the extermination of the Tutsi. Um, in uh, Iraq, uh, uh, I uh, had the okay occasion to meet with members of the Yazidi minority, uh, women, uh, girls as young as 12 and 13 who had been sexually enslaved uh, by ISIS. And today, of course, we deal with the reality uh, of the genocide against the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. Well, once again, uh, systematic sexual violence is an integral part of the, the wider uh, uh, genocidal uh, campaign and campaign of ethnic cleansing. So we have to understand that the social constructions that we call gender um, have very, very real consequences on the world that we create, as uh, my uh, distinguished uh, co-panelists that came before me have already uh, mentioned. Um, perhaps I will uh, end by sharing just a small story which speaks to how um, men, boys who uh, perpetrate violence, uh, very often are merely a train wreck of uh, shame, uh, humiliation, um, who by dominating women feel that they can somehow be uh, empowered. It is not only an illusion, it is a catastrophic illusion and one uh, which certainly uh, has not and does not serve men well. 
And the story that I would share with you is that of a man named uh, Ahmad uh, al Khatib uh, in a prison in Duhuk, uh, northern Iraq, in 2016, when ISIS was still in control of Mosul. I had gone to uh, Duhuk together with uh, my distinguished friend, who I believe is participating today, Canadian journalist Sally Armstrong. And um, Ahmed was an ISIS suicide bomber. Um, he had been captured before he could uh, detonate uh, his bomb. And now he sat in a prison, a 16 year old boy who was both robbed of his freedom, but also robbed of what he imagined to be the glory of martyrdom. And as we spoke with him, he gave us this ideological speech about how the enemies of Islam must be destroyed and all that he had been brainwashed with as a desperate, impoverished, vulnerable uh, youth who had experienced the catastrophic violence uh, of the war in Syria and Iraq. And just before the guards came to take him back to his prison cell, he muttered something, which I will never forget. He said, I miss my mother. I miss my mother. I had wanted to go to school and become a doctor. And it made me think, what turned Ahmed the healer into Ahmed the killer? What was the chain of events that led to this uh, tragic, uh, unfortunate end for this young man? And therein, I reflected on how having lost everything, having lost everything, the one bond that he could not forget was his bond with his mother. And I will end simply by saying that in all of these scenes of atrocities that I mentioned, uh, uh, Bosnia, Rwanda, and, and, and what have you, I've also seen not just women being victims, but women being leaders in the most remarkable ways. In Bosnia, there were the mothers of Srebrenica who demanded justice for the 8,000 men and boys who were unceremoniously executed in the summer of 1995. In Rwanda, uh, we had widows groups that did extraordinary work in trying to rehabilitate the survivors of the genocide. Today in the refugee camps in Kutupalong in Bangladesh, we have the Shanti Mohila, the women who are against impossible odds, uh, trying to reclaim their uh, uh, humanity. And I will end by going back to my country of origin, Iran, where today we have the Nelson Mandela of our country, a woman by the name of Nasrin Sutude, languishing in prison with a 38 year sentence because she has the courage to be a human rights lawyer. And I will end by saying that Nasreen's torture and imprisonment demonstrates most vividly what I try to say at the outset, that Have we, I wonder if we have lost Payam there. Um, I think we may have momentarily lost Payam at a, such, a, such an unfortunate moment but, um, after such a, such a moving and compelling presentation, but we will hopefully regain the, the connection. Um, and so I will now turn to Fatima Zaman, the fourth of our, of our panelists. She's an advocate at the Kofi Annan Foundation, working on building peace, security, and overcoming extreme violence in conflict. Uh, she's also a member of the inaugural class of Obama scholars, uh, selected by uh, President and, and Mrs. Obama to receive this prestigious, one-of-a-kind leadership uh, award from the Obama Foundation. Fatima, please. Thank you, Shami. And, uh... I hope I can do justice um, to my fellow panelists and participants today. Um, it's such an honor to be here. Um, I will not quote facts and figures because Maria did that. 
Um, Mobina talked about the lived experiences of women and Payam talked about the difficulties of being an ally. So what I will talk about is my own experiences and tell you a story. Um, at the tender age of 13, I witnessed the most horrific uh, terrorist attacks to take place in the United Kingdom. Those were the London 7-7 attacks. At a formidable point of my life, at a time when you're coming into your own identity and you're questioning who you are, to experience violence like that, it fast tracks your development and leaves you with a trauma that is, I failed to process until I was 23 years old, 10 years later. But witnessing a horrific act of violence made me question, who do I want to be? What is my purpose? And what do I stand for? Being a brown Muslim female was compounded by the attacks I was getting from the far right by saying, you do not belong, you do not have a voice and you do not have a space. So that was the context in which I was finding myself. And actually at the age of 17, I met Shami at a Women of the World uh, conference where she spoke and I was, who is this woman who is so incredible, who speaks truth to power, wears suits because she doesn't want to wear dresses. And I remember Shami making a point saying, why do I have to wear skirts and dresses just to be a good lawyer? And I thought, my gosh, I want to be her. Um, and so the importance of role models and women who are comfortable in their own spaces and owning those spaces and places and calling out the crap that um, society casts for women is something that I wanted to surround myself with. A few years later, I found myself at the UN where uh, Maria was uh, speaking and opening the General Assembly. Again, I found myself inspired by another brilliant woman uh, leading the General Assem Assembly, standing side by side with um, the Gen uh, Secretary General. And I thought, I want to be her and I want to stand there. Not because it was a position of power, but yes, but because it was about owning my history, owning my experiences and owning my future. Because for so long, I was told as a woman, you should not speak. As a young woman, you do not belong. As a woman of color, how dare you want to occupy these spaces? And as a um, you know, uh, woman of, of an ethnic minority, you have no voice. So that is the reality. I was reduced to a statistic. I was told you should not be, you should, apologies, there's some drilling going on. I will. <laughs> there we go uh, wonders of working from home I was told time and time again you cannot be this empowered woman you cannot be an owner of your own legacy but then I was seeing these incredible women who were mistresses of their own destiny and it just didn't fit who was I meant to be and so through my work I've actually wanted to open up the spaces for other young women to become peace builders, to work in a way that they can own their own identities, but craft the space in a way that makes them feel comfortable. And the three things that I do is making sure that we speak truth to power, we are unapologetic about our own lived experiences, and that we are understanding of what women before us have done. And part of that is recognizing that actually we need to understand that gender equality or female equality, um, as I like to call it, is not just a Western construct developed in the West and imported to the rest of the world. In places like Bosnia, where I've worked, in places like uh, South Asia or East Africa, where I've had the opportunity to work with women peace builders, we need to apply a decolonized version of gender equality. We need to take off these liberal um, uh, you know, narratives of empowerment and disenfranchised women. I'm a Muslim and many, many times we see the narrative of Muslim women being written as disempowered, not free, not being able to speak, veiled. These are things that we need to check in ourselves as uh, leaders in this space. These are things that we need to ask about our own biases and we absolutely cannot approach it as a, we are exporting a value or a view from the West to the rest of the world because it will not take a true gender equality cannot be achieved if we are to impose those views on others. So really when, we, when we've worked with women in, in rural parts of rural Afghanistan or, or rural Tanzania, it has really been understanding what does empowerment mean for them? What does freedom look like for them? And what does equality look like for them in this non-Western view? We cannot take our you know, um, narrative that is imbibed with colonial underpinnings and import it to the rest of the world. And I think that's a really important point to uh, stress because as a woman of multi-layered identities, multicultural, um, you know, I've talked about being Muslim and British and Bengali and, and minority ethnic, it is really important that 
all these aspects of myself and other people on this call are brought up, celebrated equally and given the space to breathe. Um, and, and really that's what I want to say about making sure that we have this conversation in a timely and appropriate way and, and, and we share our lived experience as much as um, um, anything um, because that's the way we can truly, truly make process of progress. Thank you very much. Well, yet another wonderful contribution. And I hope that those that are um, that are on this call are, are, are enjoying as much as I am the, the, the various layers and themes that are developing. We've heard um, we've heard about uh, these issues at the at the at the very macro level um, of the of, of the UN, and we've heard also about um, about very small but powerful human stories. Uh, the young man that Payam described, um, and, and and the multiple identities that that Fatima feels in herself and 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 seeks to understand in these different groups of women all over the world, so that they are genuinely being empowered um, and not and not lectured uh, or hectored. I think so. Now we've got some we've we've had some questions coming in um, already before the session started and during the session. Um, Dawn Ely um, asked what the panelists' advice um, was and experience in, in relation to cultures um, where men had perhaps less respect for women as leaders. Um, uh, uh, I, I suppose this does feed into some extent to, to Fatima's discussion about, uh, about different cultures and about multiple identities. So yeah, there's a particular question there from Dawn Ely. Um, and um, another question uh, focused in, I think, on um, comments that Maria made at the beginning about what's going to be happening in Mexico next week and the uh, Equality Forum there and the Compact. Um, there was a question from Senate Minari um, about how that links in with the Beijing Declaration and, and, and perhaps um, could she expand on that? Um, and then earlier um, there was um, there was um, a, a question about um, once more about understanding masculine norms and the way in which they may differ um, in the in the in, in the diff in different parts of the world and um, and how um, how we think that, uh, that that men can can engage uh, with challenging some of those norms as as allies in this in this struggle for for gender justice really might be one way of one way of putting it nobody of course has mentioned so far um the 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 developing nature of sex and gender norms um nobody is is presenting on this panel for example uh as i understand it as as, as non-binary there, there, there may be a, a question there about how some of these um these new um new identities or or, or new um self-definitions will, will affect um the uh the, the traditional struggle but i'm gonna see who wants to who wants to respond first to those those contributions so far perhaps i'll go to back to to payam just because he was so unceremoniously cut off um by by the internet i wonder if i have him back uh, yes, I, I, I apologize. I apologize. Not at all. Um, no, I, I think you raise a very important point, uh, uh, and it goes back to gender as a social construction mm -hmm. and the complexity of gender, uh, which is why um, this is not about women against men or men against women. It's about the d discovery and realization of our shared potential as human beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and it's essential to understand that dynamic. So uh, a, a man that has to prove himself through violence and domination uh, is causing harm both to his victims and to his own self. Uh, so I always like to speak about the feminine self, the feminine self, which includes feminine attributes uh, that men have. And we could even go into questions of child psychology and child rearing and the process of socialization by which we assume boys have to be one way, girls have to be the other. Carol Gilligan's uh, work um, on this process of socialization of children is, is remarkable. And it was revolutionary at the time in the 1980s, but today it has become a, a mainstream understanding. But I think we need to explore it uh, beyond slogans and platitudes. 
uh, and we really need to understand what does it mean in our own lives, in our own daily interactions. And if I could just say one last thing, we have this thing called the ego, where we are always threatened if we feel that we need to change, that we are the ones uh, that are part of the problem rather than part of the solution. So it takes a certain courage to rise above one's own uh, ego and selfish interests and to say, well, this, this is, you know, you, you, as Mahatma Gandhi famously said, you have to be the change that you, you want in the world. And the real revolutionary changes, I think, do not come because we elect one political party as opposed to the other. Mm -hmm. There are the seismic grassroots cultural shifts in consciousness, and we are already in the middle of uh, such a shift today. Well, thank you, Payam. It was it was worth persevering with that internet um, connection. Is 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 all, is all I can say. Could I could I go back to Maria for a moment with that with that um, with that request for um, a, a, a little more about the compact and about what might be happening in Mexico next week? Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Shami, and say that I'm so touched and inspired by the personal stories shared uh, by all of you, and in particularly, of course, by, by Fatima. And, and uh, if uh, we want an example of, of an empowered change maker, uh, uh, here she, uh, there she is. And uh, I think that is uh, what we need. The world needs uh, millions of, of Fatimas uh, you know, with the, the same uh, power, strength, audacity. Uh, I, I, keep, I keep saying this to, to my colleagues, especially from the younger generations, uh, that uh, you have a great responsibility uh, ahead of you. Uh, coming back to the, to the Generation Equality Forum, uh, basically uh, the Generation Equality Forum, it's an initiative that started um, during my tenure as president of the UN General Assembly, uh, the idea was to commemorate the 25 years of the landmark uh, Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. And uh, basically, uh, we very quickly realized, uh, uh, oh, it's UN Women, leadership from Mexico and France, and basically uh, uh, it has been a co-creation, co-building effort of about two years. And, and very quickly we realized that it was not uh, very much about uh, it, you know, coming up with a new agenda, with another you know, commitment to be made, but really to push hard on the implementation deficit. So uh, the Generation Equality Forum, it's about action. It's about concrete commitments. It's about financing the gender equality agenda and the women's rights agenda in all fronts. Uh, there are six action coalitions on, on very critical issue for, uh, issues for the uh, women's rights agenda, uh, the, the climate justice, uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, violence against uh, women, economic empowerment, uh, the strengthening of, uh, of uh, feminist movements around the world, and of course, this uh, new compact on women, peace and security. And the compact, basically, uh, it's, it's not another declaration of principles. It is about monitoring, right. cooperating, advising countries to deliver and implement on the women, peace and security agenda, especially on uh, implementing the resolution, Security Council Resolution 1325. And, and I think that it, it is not that, you know, the arithmetics of inequality, uh, the, the numbers are important, but perhaps more important than the numbers are structural changes that are needed in society. And, and Payam was, was so right. You know, gender is a social construction, mm -hmm. uh, power, what do we mean by power and what are the things that need to change in our societies? And we do have an opportunity because uh, we are uh, in a moment of, uh, of rebuilding, of building forward, of not going back to the same old normal because uh, you know inequalities, violence against women, crisis and conflict, climate change are not normal. 
you know, there are symptoms of dysfunctional societies in a way. So yeah. what uh, we need is, is a new pact, a new mm -hmm. contract between society, the economy, our planet um, yeah, as well, and politics and yeah. power. So, I'm so sorry. Glad, Maria, I am so glad that you said that and you and and that you brought up the uh, the pandemic, the relationship between the pandemic and all of these issues. And I, I, I'm speaking from London and we have these very um, unseemly arguments that are happening now uh, between Britain and the EU about uh, about vaccine and vaccine nationalism we have we have our health secretary saying well we've got the better contract we we negotiated the superior contract and and then we have you know suggestions that there you know that, that there's going to be kind of nationalistic protectionist um measures taken in 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 europe and i'm thinking that's all very well that's a little spat between britain and europe but what about the world <laughs> What about vaccinating the planet? Because we can hasn't the pandemic taught us that we're not a little island that can that can protect itself from from a pandemic by ignoring the the, the rest of the planet. But um, could I perhaps bring Mabina back? Because there are some questions, Mabina, about the particular challenges in this moment that come from, in particular, authoritarian governments and fundamentalist groups and the particular challenges that 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 presents to um to any ideas of of, of gender justice or or or, or broader um a broader social economic and cultural progress of the kind that um that maria's been been, been, been talking about i, I wonder mabina if you can draw on your experience um in relation to to, to that question well, before I do that, I would love to speak for a second on the COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I, I belong to a political group uh, of, of, of parliament, not a political group of parliamentarians, which we are preoccupied with the issue of, you know, vaccines mm -hmm. for around the world and how we can uh, push our government and other governments to make sure that we, you know, have vaccines for the world. I do a lot of work in East Africa, in Africa, and. I'm so preoccupied with what's happening with no COVID. They're looking at uh, the vaccines. They're looking three years from now, and and you know it is so short-sighted because mm -hmm. we don't live in a in a in a crystal ball just around you know somebody comes into our country and it changes things. So mm -hmm. we are we look we are very short-sighted around the vaccine debate. But that's not what you asked me. And as for the fundamental, it's my um, as a first Muslim senator in Canada. Um, even though people think Canada is uh, very equal, and we are, but there's work to do. Um, it was a real challenge. And when I hear from, heard from Fatima, it triggered me many things when I became a senator. And uh, I became a senator uh, one week after 9-11. And so uh, first Muslim senator one week after 9-11 and immediately had the terrorism bill. And there's a culture in the Senate that you don't speak for almost a year. You learn it is that culture has disappeared now. But and I, I and I and I kept hearing about all the issues and and yet my community around me was all being racially profiled because we were Muslims. And so it was uh, what uh, so you know it is a, a real challenge uh, being a Muslim uh, in a in in this era because uh, people. Who do people, uh, that's where I want us to, uh, to go to is that it really frustrates me that even today, this, the politicians will go to speak to the fundamental leaders. And that's what they will see as the standard. They, that's what they will see as the standard of community. And why do they go to them? Because they see that's where the power of the community is. That's where they see that that's where the uh, decisions are made. And so I'm continuously saying to my colleagues, who are you speaking to? Are you speaking to the women? And they always say, well, we couldn't find the women. And I'm, uh, I said, take me, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to the women. Don't say you can't find the women or take me to the moderate voice. Don't say you can't find it. And so decisions are made often on what fundamental people, fundamentalists are saying. And it really frustrates me that that's where it's seen as power. And so if you look at power and political power, coming back to our discussion 
on um, uh, political power. It, it's, uh, you know, even when women are making progress, even in my country, in Canada, we are making progress. But when I look at a minister and I'm happy that there are many women ministers, but then when you analyze what power do they have, what ministries they have, you have to look, are we really, I believe that all of this, whether it's about fundamentalism or whether it's equality of women, there needs to be a cultural change. The big thing needs to be is there needs to be a cultural change. And, you know, as Fatima was saying, you know, when I came into the Senate, it was perceived that I would be a quiet Muslim woman, right? <laughs> and I'm far from it. And so that led to challenges. You know, I, then I was seen as loud because I wasn't a quiet Muslim woman. So what I'm saying is, people's cultural ideas of what a person should be. That's where the cultural change needs to happen. And uh, if you can give me one more minute, I, want, mm -hmm. I, I argue with my, uh, my colleague now uh, that, you know, what is culture? Culture is, I, I'm in, from, from East Africa, came, my grandparents came from India to East Africa, they brought culture. And they, that culture became frozen in East Africa, like dowry and uh, women's rights and everything. And then they brought it here to Canada and it was frozen culture. And so what you have to look at is what's the culture. So I tell people now look at what's the culture in India now, because culture is evolving just as it's evolved in this country, it's evolved in other places as well. And so don't freeze us in a culture that doesn't exist. And I think political change will happen when culture changes and it's a cultural issue, whether it's about fundamentalism, whether it's whether it's about here in Canada now, we have to look at what's the cultural, what's the cultural issue. Thank you, Mabina, which, which makes me want to turn to, um, to Fatima again, because, um, because cultural progress is not painless, is it, um, Fatima? And indeed, there are cultural conflicts even uh, within so-called progressive communities. And I'm, and I'm gonna ask the hardest question to the youngest panelist because I genuinely want her perspective, which is some of these incredibly toxic debates uh, between self-identifying feminists of a certain generation in particular, but some feminists and, um, uh, and, 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 um, and people who, who, who espouse trans-inclusive arguments. And these have been, to, to my mind, some of the most disappointing um, debates, as much as much for their tone um, and lack of and, and lack of mutual respect and solidarity um, as for the, the the actual issues. I wonder if our youngest panelist can can help us, Fatima. Uh, thank you, Shami. Not an easy question, and I will do my best to answer. And thank you, Maria and Mabina, for for the massive support. Um, I think there is an element of overly over wokeness. I'm going to use that term <laughs> as the millennial of the panel. It, it would seem every time there is a gendered conversation or, um, you know, a huge thing happens like last week and Sarah Everard being murdered in the streets of Britain and the violence against women and the police backlash against that in Europe. Um, this type of violence happens every day on the streets of India where women are raped on buses and nobody sees it. Okay, first and foremost. So when it seems to happen in a certain part of the world, i.e. the West, we automatically put up our arms and say, this is unacceptable. But gender-based violence is happening all across the world in places that are far away from home and that are um, inconvenient to us. So first of all, we need to check those inconvenient truths and allow ourselves to absorb um, those, those issues that are happening and accept them as our own in order to be able to make meaningful difference. The second element is we're all keyboard warriors. It's very easy for me to go on Twitter and type 240 characters expressing solidarity or canceling JK Rowling for her incorrect um, views around um, you know, sexuality and, and heteronormativity and, and, and trans people. And then at the same time, like we saw with Black Lives Matter, if you're an ally, you're not doing enough. And if you're not speaking, then you're a bystander. And you know, if you're a black person, you've been drowned out. And there is so much over correctness and wokeness that is everyone is trying to demonstrate, but let's strip it all back this is not about clout um, or clicktivism or, you know, getting the likes and the shares because, we're, we, you know, that does nothing to progress the movements of minorities. That does nothing to progress the movements of people. So all these um, celebrities and influencers or politicians who jump on a bandwagon and take the knee because somehow it's popular and it's sexy and it's easy to do and it's the right time. 
Where were you when these minority groups were struggling <laughs> 15 years ago? Where were you when nobody was giving this space um, oxygen? Where were you? Please do not turn up as the savior at the last minute because you are harming that minority group so much more than you are helping. Um, so that savior mentality, do away with it. That um, you know Western mentality of suddenly it's close to home and it's our problem, but actually when it's far away, it's too it's too it's too real, and I don't want to deal with it. Get rid of that. And all of this cancel culture, woke culture, um, that my generation does because it's called collectivism is something that I absolutely will call out of my peers. I will absolutely say, um, you know, everything is so multifaceted. It's complex, and we need to give it space to deal and express and evolve our emotions and and deal with the well-being issues that arise from from these deep conversations that we are having. It's not about clout sharing or, um, you know, being that savior that comes in to fix a problem. Where are you when the going gets tough? To be cliche, you know, where are you when we're at the start of this conversation, not right at the end of it when progress is almost almost about to be made. Um, I will stop there, otherwise I could go on forever and call out lots of people um, who I'm dying to call out. But it is really important that when we are having these conversations, they are reflective of the diversity um, and the minority groups who are always squeezed out by, by the more privileged um, 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 members of, of this conversation. And, and if I may, Shami. Please, if, please. If I may uh, respond, you know, we talk about gender, but uh, you know, as gender on its own is uh, for people like me, is is does not uh, get me in a better place. There's also the issue of racism. And mm -hmm. so as a young lawyer, when young women lawyers were looking at issues of, you know, getting positions on the bench and et cetera, and I would always say, but you have to include me as well. And they mm -hmm. would say, no, 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 you will mess up if we also include race. Let's first get gender in, and then we will look at race. And I yeah. would always say, are you going to divide me? Am I going to go first half as woman and then later on when the world is ready, the other half under race? I am, I am gender and race, you have to take both. And so I think that when we cannot look at gender on its own, we, can, we have to also look at other, other uh, factors and race is a very big factor. And I know that for me, uh, as the first woman uh, practicing law, a woman, South Asian woman practicing law in Canada, the challenges were horrendous. And it was not just because of my gender, but also for what many times I was taken as the interpreter. And you know, why are you, interpreters don't speak in court. That was my reality, happily, that's not the case now. But I'm just saying that, you know, we also in gender can't look at it in isolation. We also have to look at issues of race. I wonder because we are into these questions of, on the one hand, intersectionality, as the as the young people call it, um, but but also I'm afraid questions sometimes of a lack of solidarity even um, in, in in progressive uh, movements. I wonder if, um, if 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 Payam or Maria would like to say anything about that challenge. Do I have either? Do I have Payam? <laughs> Well, uh, unless Ambassador Espinoza has uh, wishes to say something, I'll, I'll just share something briefly. I really enjoyed what Fatima said, and I'm sorry that my internet was disrupted, so I missed much of your your, your speech. Uh, I hope to be able to read you or, or hear what you have to say otherwise. Um, but but I think that we, we need to, uh, other than the issues of intersectionality, we need to understand the nature of a materialistic culture. We live in a consumerist culture, which pervades uh, uh, all of those intersections and the way we address them. So um, one dimension of that is instant gratification. We live in an incredibly superficial culture where we want at the click of a, a, a mouse or, or, or whatever to have the world at our fingertips. And when you look at historical struggles, um, they all involve sacrifice. You have to be willing to pay a real price uh, for your beliefs and, 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 and not simply engage in virtue signaling and, and what have you. Um, and perhaps uh, I can go back to what I was saying when I got you know, cut off. I was speaking about Nasreen Sotudeh as, as one of you know, the icons, icons of the global human rights movement. Nasreen Sotudeh is a mother of two children. She's a loving mother. She's a wonderful, 
uh, a person. She's a human rights lawyer, and her job was simply to defend people before Iran's courts. And they've taken her in and out of prison, subjected her to torture, intimidation again and again. She has never given in to her tormentors. And that is the new definition of power, that she has stood up to the might and power of the Islamic Republic of Iran with its military might, its vast resources and intelligence capabilities. And she's basically saying, I am willing to pay for my beliefs with my life, which is exactly why they have not killed her, because they're afraid of her, because they know that if they kill her, she will become the martyr and millions will come out on the streets. So of course, that's a very extreme situation. But getting back to Fatima said, I, I think that something which pervades all of these intersections of identity is something that I would like to call authenticity. Auth are we really authentic in our empathy? Because we also have this culture of pseudo empathy. We want to feel virtuous without paying a price. And, and that I think uh, is something that we need to, to challenge or as Fatima said, to call out. <laughs> Absolutely. And and Maria, we haven't heard from you for a while. I wonder if you want to respond to anything that you've heard, but also I have a question, a particular, very particular question about um, the challenges, the ongoing challenges in, in Afghanistan. I don't know if you want to, to address that. And, a, and another question about the um, uh, uh, about violence against women um, in conflict situations and how one can ever uh, how one can ever try and, um, and and move away from that because it is such a it, it is so endemic and it is so easy in, in to use women and violence against women as a as a weapon of war. Maria, if I still have you. Yes, of course, uh, of course, I'm 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 listening, you know, attentively to to a very enriching conversation and. And uh, you know, responding to to the questions on the Afghanistan uh, peace process, I uh, co-signed a, a letter, uh, really asking uh, for women to take part of the negotiations, uh, without the voice and agency of women in in, in the Afghani uh, peace, it would be a very very difficult. Uh, uh, to reach uh, to reach uh, an agreement, uh, this letter was co-signed by uh, you know a huge fan of of, of uh, I am um, I am part of uh, uh, the group of women leaders for change and inclusion. It is uh, uh, a network of fifty four women uh, uh, working to strengthen multilateralism as a vehicle. Uh, for gender equality and uh, and I really I really hope that uh, there is uh, meaningful progress and on the second issue of um, of uh, uh, women uh, as uh, as uh, weapons of war and in uh, sexual harassment and abuse uh, of uh, women and girls in conflict situations the the numbers are are staggering are painful because uh, you know, I think 96% of the victims uh, are, are women and girls in, in, in conflict situations. But, uh, you know, the, the, the resilience and the strength of women is also, uh, you know, has been incredible in, in, in situations of, of extreme conflict. And basically the call is for uh, not only uh, protecting um, the rights and dignity of women in conflict situations, but to have them at the decision-making table. And, and I think that Mobina was so, so um, clear uh, with uh, the uh, example that she gave in the Darfur case and the voices of women. And, and we can not only, you know, see women and even from the younger generations and, and girls only as victims, but as, as agents of change, as, uh, as having a strong voice uh, that can uh, transform in, in, in change very, very difficult situations. I have been very, very closely, uh, you know, uh, working with um, uh, women and female um, um, refugees in, in Ecuador. Uh, we had uh, for decades now a very high number of Colombian refugees. 
And if you look at the numbers, uh, more than 60% of the Colombian refugees in Ecuador are female. And uh, you have uh, no idea, you know, the, 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 the strength, the clarity, uh, the capacity of thinking and planning, uh, you know, uh, the future and for them and for their families um, in a way that it, it really, you know, is, is very, very telling. So I, I think that this is not only about optics, about it is nice to have women at the table when we are, you know, preventing, uh, negotiating peace and in post-conflict situation, it is not a nice to have. It is a must because if you want sustainability, if you want quality, if you want, uh, if you want uh, really uh, to build uh, peaceful societies, it is about the role and voice of, of, of women. And of course, we have to add, you know, all these uh, words that are, you know, so useful sometimes to simplify a long explanation, like uh, transactionality, for example, or, or, or like uh, sorority, which is so much needed these days. And, and sometimes we tend to think that because you're a female, you know, a sorority is in your genes or in your DNA. <laughs> no, it, it does not happen that way. You know, the issue of politics, of, of alignment on A or B, it's not only about, uh, it, it is not only a women's issue. And, and there I, I would like to, to agree with, with Payam is, is, uh, is about, you know, strong and specific, you know, commitments mm -hmm. uh, and a built-in, you know, sorority. Um, and, um, and for that, we need to, to work hard uh, to fight stereotypes, to fight, uh, you know, values and cultures. I, I really love what Fatima said about uh, decolonizing in a way uh, uh, the, the concept of gender equality, uh, even, you know, it cannot be seen as a, as a Western construct, um, mm -hmm. you know women's rights are human rights. It is about the dignity of, of women and girls uh, worldwide. And uh, yeah, and the dignity of men too, and the dignity of men and boys too, who suffer, who suffer in different ways, but, but terrible ways from this, um, from this catastrophic um, structure, as Payam said. Can I bring Mabina back for a moment? Because Mabina, I have a question here from Aditi Gupta who says that some of the hardest work um, in addressing racism, gender and, and other inequalities um, can be within our own social and professional circles. Um, could I ask how you've dealt with, 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 with incredibly white male spaces that are, that are slow to, um, to embrace equitable diversity? I think Mabina, in the light of your, uh, your your experience of, of, of entering the Senate when you did, you might have some some pearls of wisdom here. Well, I'll, I'll start with uh, the Senate has not been as difficult for me as my legal profession was. Uh, in my legal profession, being the first South Asian woman, you know, as I earlier said that even going to the courthouse, the number of times I was referred to as an interpreter or as the accused was uh, a real challenge and even within the profession uh, to, to make any strides was very difficult. But you know, people very quickly realized I wasn't going away anywhere. And so I would be at every meeting, I would be at every commitment. And then even for my um, uh, political career, I, I, was, uh, I came here as a refugee and uh, uh, happily in, in, a, in a grocery lineup, I met with a woman that was involved the Liberal Party and I joined and I would take on every task that there was, including washing dishes, doing resolutions because I had a background as a lawyer. And so I can say that I held every position in the Liberal Party, including being vice president of the National Liberal Party and the president of Women's Commission before I became a politician. And for me and for many of us, it was uh, you know putting in the hours on every day working at it over time to get to get in. But once I came to, to the Senate, um, uh, first I was sort of a, you know, like a kudos, 
uh, people, I was four in one. I was a woman. I was a Muslim woman. I was a first South Asian woman and a first woman of African descent in the Senate. So I was sort of seen as four in one and, and the pride of the party. And, but I, what I did have is I had the ear of the prime minister, Prime Minister Kretian. And I, because I'd been in the party, I knew the players. So I would, when they, when they would talk, especially around the terrorism bill, I would say to them, you're talking to me, you're talking to me. I'm a Muslim woman. And if you have this concept of Muslim, I'm a Muslim woman too. So let's look at me and say, what, you know, am I a fundamentalist? Just like there are people who are in, in the um, uh, community that are fundamentalist, as they are in Christianity, they are in Muslims, but you have to look at the voice of the moderate. And what I, by say, explaining all that to, to people, I'm saying to you is that we can't give up. We have to be in the space. And I have no shame. I'll go anywhere. I'll go anywhere, uh, even if I have to sit in the back row and uh, find a way to be heard, because that's the only way we will get heard. And happily for me now, it's not as difficult, but there are other challenges within the system. And so I, I, I say to people who are listening is that um, I had to outwork people and that's what I did. Thank you so much. Payam, I've had a question, a very provocative um, question and pithy question in the chat about widows. Um, and, and, and the questioner says, widows, why the silence? over their roles and their needs. I, I wonder if this is something you would like to, you would like to uh, address. This is from, this is actually from uh, the president of Widows for Peace. Yes, it's a very good question. And uh, I had briefly referred uh, to Rwanda, uh, where there was, a, I have a, a, a dear, uh, beloved friend who's now become my sister, Esther Mujawayo, I hope you invite her. To one of the panels next because she was one of the uh, survivors of the 1994 uh, genocide. Her, her story is incredible how she managed to be saved uh, in so-called Hotel Rwanda with her three little girls in the middle of the killing. And, and then she went on to create Avov, which is an organization of widows in Rwanda who um, did phenomenal work in helping the survivors uh, uh, gather resources to essentially make a living, to get them a plot of land, a, a cow, or, or, or whatever the case may be, uh, to, to let them uh, uh, earn a livelihood. So uh, uh, widows organizations, my experience has been, are very significant, even more significant are mothers, mothers who have lost their children. Whether we talk about the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, mm -hmm. who went in front of the presidential palace the middle of the military junta, who said, we have nothing to lose. We have lost our children. Take us to prison, torture us, kill us. We don't care. The mothers of Khavaran in my own country in Iran, who in 1988 had 5,000 of their children uh, uh, executed. So uh, this is a, 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 an example of agency, <laughs> that, that these people are not just victims. They're not just survivors, that they can also not just speak back or, or speak out as uh, Senator uh, Jaffer has uh, very eloquently put, but how they can um, allow us to reimagine what power means. And uh, it goes back to the suicide bomber who thought about mm -hmm. his mother when he had lost everything. And it goes back to the women who today in Srebrenica, in uh, the refugee camps of Bangladesh, um, are giving us a different image of, of what it means to reclaim your humanity uh, against impossible odds. Thank you so much, Payam. I, I, I notice um, um, with some sadness that our time is beginning to, uh, our time together is beginning to, uh, to, to, to run out. And at the very end, I would like to bring Neda back for uh, any, um, any final reflections from her on the event that she has worked so hard to, to convene for all of us today. But before, um, before I do go back to Neda at the end, could I, can I call on Fatima, um, who is our future and who is our representative of, uh, as she put it herself, the, the millennials, um, and, and really just get a reaction from Fatima on, on, on any of the, the questions and comments um, that have been made since, since she was last on. Fatima. Thank you. Thank you, Shami, um, and thank you all. What a what a privilege um, to to have the sort of 
final word, there will always be those who benefit from polarizing narratives. There will always be those who benefit from a culture war, who benefit from starting, um, uh, you know, dichotomizing men and women against each other. It is the oldest trick in the book, whether in war, whether in times of peace, or whether in times of, of, of pandemic, shall we say. There are always those who will peddle a narrative that will, you know, push women to the margins of society, that will push women to the outskirts and always seek to exclude us from spaces. This is made worse for women who are of different race, races, faiths, uh, sexualities, genders, you know, non-men essentially are the ones who suffer by, by those uh, peddlers of, of dangerous narratives. And ultimately what I will close by saying is it is not enough to just have a conversation. We've talked about really, really important um, issues. But my question to you is what will you do next? You know, what is the concrete action myself, Mobina, Payam, Neda, Shami, Maria, every 113 participants on this call, what will you do next to advance your own agency and advance gender equality for everyone? Because as they say, the future is female. Thank you very much. <laughs> One wonderful, inspirational final words from Fatima. And, and now I'd like to bring, I would like to bring Neda back because she has brought us all together. And I, I, I want to get a final reaction from, from her. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful to have, have had the privilege of, of, of moderating this and, and listening to it. Um, but, but Neda, how, how, how are you feeling um, this has gone? Um, well, thank you, you very there? much um, for all our speakers, um, for such wonderful insights, va invaluable insights and from your experiences and also for, for our participants to joining and for the questions they've put to the panelists. I think what I really wanted to show was that this issue of e equality, equity, is not just about women alone, it's about all of us. We're all in this together and we all want to have peace. And the only way we can get to our goal, our end goal is peace, is if we all work together. There's no us and them in this scenario. As Payam said, if you're a victim, you're a, a, if you're a perpetrator, you're also a victim in this situation. We've all been in this pandemic. We've all suffered together. We know what it's like now to be in a state of war. We've had this state of war from this virus. So even if you were in this part of the world that was in the Middle East and you weren't affected by the conflict there, you know what it feels like now to be isolated, to be stuck in this house, not being socializing, not being doing anything. So the, the theme was to be able to come together with our all experiences and not put this, you know, us and them that we have learned that we need to work together. And I think the panelists have really shown us um, in all their beautiful, representations here that there is hope as we have seen from the pandemic there was struggle women did struggle from the shadow pandemic but we also saw how the nhs how the frontline workers what the sacrifices they made all these contributions so there is a lot of good in humanity and that voice of the good in humanity has to rise up above all the evils that happened by other people so we need stronger voices stronger calls for unity rather than silencing our voices so thank you so much thank you for all your contributions and thank, also thank you, you to panelists thank you neda maria payam fatima and to everybody who came and gave of their time thank you everybody stay safe stay thank safe you. thank you shami for moderating bye-bye